Thanks, Roxanne. And uh, it's great to see everybody here. Uh, before I forget, um, Roxanne, you may want to look this up. I want to give a pub to our, uh, our colleagues at uh, HIP, which you may know better as uh, Be Well or um, Healthy Steps, depending on which side of campus you're on, because I'll be doing this workshop again, but, a, but more kind of high touch and more interactive workshoppy style. If you want to workshop your rest, um, come find me on, I think it's Fridays in July, I think is what it is. And, but, but definitely check out all the offerings from uh, Healthy Steps slash Well Be Well slash Dominique's crew at HIP because they do they bring some great speakers to campus. I think Fred Luskin is presenting and James Barras and Carol Potofsky maybe and a bunch of others. So uh, come and, and check out those, get those berries um, and all that kind of stuff. But th this will be a quick version because I talk fast and I'm gonna try to get through this. Um, having said that, I love to be interrupted. So uh, Roxanne will, will, will interrupt me. If there are questions, interrupt me because I love to uh, answer the questions while they're hot and uh, can help tie whatever theoretical rantings Donovan has to some real life experiences. And that's really important. So, so please interrupt at any time with your questions. And also love to see your face and hear your voice if you wanna do that but I also totally get it if you wanna rest your eyes and not be watched and turn off your screen. Uh, but it is good to see some familiar faces. Hello, Angela uh, and others. Uh, I will tell bad jokes. So if I tell a bad joke and you appreciate the bad jokes that you're hearing, you can, the, the dad jokes or the bad jokes, uh, because I do both, you can give me a thumbs up or a hee 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 or a teary eyed smiley face or whatever. Uh, love to see that. Okay, let's see if I can figure out share screen and uh, get, a, oh, um, I think I put into, did I put it into the thing? Maybe I didn't, hold on the a chat. second. There's an, yeah, there's an article uh, which I just put in there. My colleague Colin Campbell sent me this uh, from insighttimer.com, a blog on the types of rest from Dr. Uh, Dalton Smith. And I like this um, because it's really uh, a great uh, complement to what I'm going to be talking about today. Answering the question, Donovan, why is it that we uh, can get a, uh, a lot of sleep and, and sit on the couch and watch a lot of Netflix and still feel exhausted? I think this article helps us to understand that there are many types of rest. There are many types of resourcing. And if, if we, you know, look, look, if you have a bunch of buckets, one is grain, one is water, one is uh, vitamins, I don't know, one is protein, one is uh, sunshine, and you're filling one bucket till it overflows, but the other buckets are empty, you're going to wonder what's happening. And that's what this talk is really about, is that we need to understand not just the quantity of rest, but the quality of rest we're getting because we may be getting a lot of one kind and it may not be the kind we actually need. So let me sh share screen here. And I think, I think it's actually up on the screen now. Uh, Roxanne, can you see that the Insight Timer article? I can uh, see it. It's, you can? Yes. Yeah, so it's on my screen. So, so just to go through this, and again, shout out to not only Insight Timer folks, but uh, Dr. Chandra Dalton-Smith, but, but the types of rest that they list here, uh, and I was studying this this morning to, to, for the take home points, uh, resting your physical body, your uh, mental, the mind, by the way, includes thoughts and feelings, all activities of the mind, according to Dr. Dan Siegel. Um, it includes the uh, activities of the heart and, and, and he, Dan Siegel would actually include uh, psychological and uh, neurological activities of the gut also. So gut, heart, and head all included in the mind. Uh, sensory rest. So, so sensory, uh, I hear sensory deprivation tanks are all in style now, the little floaty tanks where you turn off all sound and sight and all that. I'm not recommending them, I'm just saying. Um, it might be because people are trying to get some sensory rest. Uh, creative rest, if you're a creative person, Maybe you need to not be so creative and actually fill your tanks with awe. Uh, we may talk about, uh, there's lots of researchers, by the way, Greater Good, uh, Dacher Keltner from the Greater Good, 
and the happiest man in the world, um, Mr. Uh, Nati Ricard, uh, have a lot of to say on the topic of awe, A-W-E, and how to, not, not, the, not the Southern California Valley Girl, awesome, but the true awesome. Um, how can you refill your, uh, your creative um, stores with, with, with the awesome? Uh, that, that's out there. And um, some authors actually use the term erotic to describe creativity and creation. So you may want to read about how to um, uh, not, not just erotic, the sexual erotic, but how to uh, resource yourself with uh, and refill the tanks of the erotic as well as the creative, as well as the awesome. Uh, number five is emotional uh, how to, um, and we, we'll, we'll, we may have some discussions today about this. If you have questions about, there's some debate over whether compassion fatigue actually exists in the compassion world. The Sea Care folks on campus, the Center for Compassion, Altruism, and Research and Education. If you hang out with those and have a cup of coffee, they will they will tell you that compassion fatigue doesn't exist, uh, but but empathic fatigue does. And now we go down a rabbit hole of compassion versus uh, empathy. So if you have questions about that, let's talk. Social rest, obviously, if you're an introvert, you're going to have a different relationship to number six than, than if you're an extrovert, okay? Because an introvert is going to need a lot of social rest. An extrovert actually gets energized often uh, from social activity, although they also need social rest too because... They're humans. Um, spiritual rest. This one is a very interesting. It's actually not rest. I would call this spiritually uh, spiritual endeavors that fill our spiritual bucket and give us perspectives and ways to uh, wrestle with our purpose on this planet uh, as individuals and as humans. Uh, this is a big one. Spirit taking times out of your day to engage in spiritual activity, whether if you're Jewish, that would be Shabbat. If you're Christian, that would be the Sabbath. Um, unfortunately, I don't know the equivalent in all other religions, but my sense is that all religions have a sense of when you come together at the end of a long work week to gather, to sing, to pray, and to be together. And did I mention to eat? And to eat. Uh, that could be a part of your spiritual. I know that eating is a spiritual experience for me. Give me a thumbs up if eating is a spiritual experience for you. Um, and, and we can see if we get any hits on that little unofficial poll. Um, all right, so let's go into, if you have any questions, please hit me up. I just went through that quickly as an add-on, some value add. You can check out that article on your own, but um, beautiful. Oops, what did I just do there? I just hit the wrong button, sorry. Let's do present mode, okay. While that's loading, Roxanne, any questions or comments so far? None at this point in time. Great. By the way, if you have students that you work with, please send them to my unit, well-being at Stanford via coaching.stanford.edu, and they can sign up to see one of our coaches. Uh, I see Angela Amarias on the line, so you can send them also if they need financial coaching and wellness, you can go to uh, uh, mom. Uh, I, I don't know if you guys use that acronym. Mom is a, a mind over money, uh, and they can get mind over money coaching uh, from their campus mom, uh, uh, from Angela Amarius and those folks. Um, but uh, yeah. All right. So this is one of my favorite titles I've ever created, and you can ask Angela. I've made, created a lot of really interesting titles for talks in my lifetime. This is one of my favorite, The Rest of Your Life. And yes, there is a double meaning uh, because the impetus for this talk is that a lot of Stanford people I've noticed undervalue rest and they undervalue the rest of their life. That is, if it's not work, this is a Silicon Valley thing. This is a, maybe this is true of our entire world right now. If it's not work, it's not worthy of anything. It's not valuable. I talked to... Uh, GSB students and medical students about, about utility and value. And, and as it turns out, the rest of our lives has no value if it's not helping me to pass my quals, if it's not helping me to pass my 
my, my med school exams to move on to the next level, then it doesn't have value. And this is a problem. This is a serious human problem. If we forget um, to rest, um, we'll, we, won't, we won't work as well. So that's one problem. But even worse than just being bad at work, um, this is a deprivation of our humanity because I think you can ask any of the ancients, the time when we come together, speaking as a Jew on Shabbat to be with our people, to eat and to celebrate and to rest is when you get to, you rise up not only from the mundane to the sublime, but you get to be a human being. Um, that's not just a, a, a beast of burden that is, that is working in the fields. And in a time when our culture, our country is reckoning with the nature of labor uh, that built this country, slave labor, as well as uh, the, the, you know, wrestling with how we pay people, Amazon, I see you, how do we pay people and what's minimum wage? Are we treating ourselves like an Amazon employee. Sorry, if, did Amazon sponsor this, any, uh, uh, Roxanne? So I'm sorry. I just, I just, uh, you're all I good. Just our sponsors, um, and 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 do we treat ourselves like indentured servitude or like slavery? Because because I, it sounds hyperbolic, and I can be hyperbolic, but if you have a system where you don't allow your workers to rest, what is that other than that a labor violation? Right. That is a labor violation if you don't allow your workers to rest. And if we do that to ourselves, then what is that? So that's the call to arms to use a, unfortunately, uh, very relevant and problematic um, violent metaphor. But that is the call to, 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 to justice, the call to work uh, in, for social justice, the call to see the humanity in ourselves and others. So the first thing, and I'll be referring a lot, um, Alex, if you're out there, I sell a lot of your books. I hope it's okay. I sell a lot of your books, Alex. Alex Pang, let's give a shout out to Alex Sujung Kim Pang, who uh, is uh, local, I think, lives in the Bay Area and wrote this fantastically researched book called Rest. Uh, Alex doesn't know me. Uh, Kepler's doesn't know that I sell a lot of their books. Go to Kepler's, go to your local book sync to buy your books. Um, but I'll refer to it a lot in this talk. Um, let's talk about mindset. Carol Dweck and, and Alia Krum just, just over there in the quad. What is your rest mindset? Is rest uh, just the spaces between work? Is it just for leisure and going to Hawaii, sitting on a chaise lounge? Or is it a way to improve the way that we do meaningful work? Uh, is rest a time to contemplate uh, our purpose? as I've said before, and thus make our work more meaningful? Is it a time to let our background processing digest our medical school uh, 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 information that we're ingesting and digest it to turn it into something creative? Or are we just, as many students do, do we just ingest a ton of really good information and then vomit it onto the exam? Thus, thus forgetting it forevermore. How many of you, how many of you did college where you just ingested a lot of stuff and then vomited on the exam and then forgot it promptly and you still don't have any idea what you studied in college, right? Because you didn't allow it to digest. As Rick Hansen would say, you didn't allow it to stick to your ribs to let it land firmly in. And I want you to let this digest today and really land firmly. I don't want you to just hear this today. I want you to ask yourself, what am I going to do after today to rethink, reevaluate rest in my life, and then, and then integrate rest into my Google Calendar? I want you to literally start to add calendar entries today of rest. That is the to-do list. That's the most tangible on-the-ground to-do list. Your calendar should look different after today because you're gonna insert little blocks of time to recover, to restore, to renew, to rejuvenate. And I could go on with about 35 other R words, but they if they're not in your calendar, you don't really value it. 
if it's not in your visa statement, you know, right, Angela, you don't really value it because what we spend money on is what we value. And what we is in our calendar, other, in other words, what we spend time on is what we value. So if it's not in your calendar, you don't value it. You can say you value it, but it's not, if it's not in your calendar, you don't value it. You don't actually value it. If it's not in your visa statement, you don't actually value it. Okay, so let's spend some time and money on rest. When we think of rest as works opposite, we take it less seriously and avoid it. So this is that devaluating, de dismissing of rest. Rest should become our, one of our highest values. They're not polar opposites. They're like sine waves that we'll see in a second. Rest and work are partners, they're, they're buddies. And to the extent that we do rest well, work will get better. And the extent that we have do meaningful work, then we, can, then we can put our head on our pillow at the end of the day and say, Donovan, you did good work today. And this is how I say it, you lived your values, right? Someone type that in the chat. When you go to bed at night, can you pump your fist and say, I lived my values today. I lived a meaningful life today. By the way, um, my colleagues at HHP, Anil Chima and Diane and those folks are teaching courses on living a meaningful life. I'm pretty sure somebody at HIP uh, is teaching courses on living a purposeful life. Because because I know, because I've taken that course. So take those courses because you want to put your head on your pillow at night and say, I can go to sleep now because I lived a meaningful life. I lived my values. One of the reasons I think we have a hard time sleeping, folks, is because we did a lot of busy work today, but we're not satisfied because the busy work didn't, isn't congruent with and, and, and resonant with our deeply held, value, held values. So, so let's, let's, let's earmark that. You will live a good life. You will die happy when you say, I lived a meaningful life that was guided by my values that led to purposeful action, right? Meaning, uh, meaningful life comes from values that lead to purposeful action. Okay, shout out to Anil Chima, and he has an activity called Making Meaning. So if you ever get to study with Anil and uh, Sarah Meyer Tapia and all those folks at, um, at, at uh, HHP, Health and Human Performance, oh, they, they actually serve students. So those are for the students. Uh, some of them teach uh, uh, continuing studies courses, then uh, by all means, um, avail yourself of their wisdom. So work and rest are not opposites. They're like points on a sine wave and we need to surf those waves. So we're gonna have times of high yield. Oh, that's the word, that's the term the medical students use. Was it high yield? So if I go to Starbucks with Johnny, was it high yield? They, 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 they capitalize and they um, objectify everything over at the business school and the law school and the medical school. This is a problem because when we objectify people, we objectify ourselves, we become objects, we are no longer humans. And remember what America and our society does to our natural resources when we objectify them, when we call them to our people, when we call them human resources, what do we do to them? We abuse them. I'm not, I'm not judging all HR people. I'm just saying, this is Utah Phillips. Be careful when, you, when your workplace calls you a human resource because do you know what we do to our human resources in America and on this planet? We abuse them until they no longer exist. So, so we want to humanize and surf the waves of high yield and low yield, high humanity, okay? High living, okay? Highs and lows, let's surf it. Any questions or comments so far? This is all in uh, Alan, Alex Pang's book. Uh, buy it, read it, get the audible version, uh, give some money to Alex. Um, I make my living uh, promoting his work and I hope he feels that he's getting something out of it too. <laughs> um, this long quote basically just ends with a very in poignant call to justice. If your work is yourself, 
when you cease to work, you cease to exist. Now, let me nail this home. And by the way, I have, a, uh, uh, I have very few things on YouTube, but I have a YouTube TEDx that I did at Pally High School uh, a little while back. Maybe Roxanne can find it. Uh, I, it desperately needs your views. Um, it is not viral uh, in, in the positive sense of viral. It is not bacterial either. It's nothing, it's not spreading. So watch it, but it, it does, uh, the sound is terrible. So that's probably why, but the, I drew the same conclusion as Alex, which is this, and this is a very, I'm gonna, just a little, little seriousness warning. This, we're gonna get real serious, real fast. When we objectify ourselves as machines of work, when either we stop working, we have no idea what to do with our humanity. We don't know what to do with our human being. Okay. We don't know what to do with the human being when we are actually a human doing. And as I said in my talk related to student health, and, and I know for a fact that there's been at least one suicide at Dartmouth re very recently, uh, someone that was linked to our community very closely, that when Stanford students decide that they are human doing, and either they lose their job or they fail a class or their startup fails or they lose their ability to do their work. And that is they over identify with themselves as a student, as, as a human doing. They may decide that it's time to stop being. They may decide that it's time to stop being. This is, I, I, this may be hyperbolic. I don't think so. I think that we are, live on a campus with all of us are over identified with our work. And when we can no longer work, we have a hard time relaxing and we have a hard time feeling like we're worthy. And this has dire, dire consequences. So what is your, what is your rest mindset? Is rest a reward that you only get if you deserve it and you're worthy of it? In other words, if you're an employer, would you say to your employees, you only get a 15 minute break if you produce product, otherwise you don't? I think that is, uh, that, is, that is crossing the line into labor abuse. Or is it that we all have a right to rest? That all humans have a right to rest, that animals have a right to rest, that the soil has a right to rest, that our planet has the right to rest, right? What is your rest mindset? So what is rest? It's resourcing. So I got this from Anil Chima again, heads up HHP, Health and Human Performance. It is moving from a state of deficit to surplus. So if the soil is resourced, then it is fertile and it's full of lots of really icky stuff, fecund matter that makes it great for growing. If it is devoid of those things and it's in a deficit state. Uh, we're in a drought right now. So we're in a deficit state of I think, I think uh, we were just talking about some of the, the reservoirs in our area that are now looking like rivers, not you know, uh, lakes. So we are in a statewide deficit of water and we need to move to, sur to a surplus state. So that's just one model here. By the way, according to Anil Chima, uh, when, it's, when you are neutral, you're backsliding. If we're not getting more water, then it's evaporating and we are getting less water. So neutral is backsliding, neutral is backsliding. If I'm not, if I'm not strengthening, actively strengthening my muscles because I'm an astronaut, then I'm backsliding. If, I re if you relax your hand right now, theoretically you're atrophying. If you're completely relaxed, you're atrophying. And only as you strengthen those hand muscles do we then get mus more muscle, okay. More R words, recovery. So let's, oh, let's continue with recovery. So I love this from Tal Ben-Shahar, the great Harvard uh, happiness guy, started the whole happiness class movement back in the day. Um, the problem is not stress at all. The problem is not stress at all. The problem is recovery. The problem is not stress. We like stress. We like push-ups. We like doing squats because they make our legs very, I do, I'm a skater. I love having strong legs. I love doing skating. I love squats because they make me feel strong. The problem is not stress, it's recovery. So 
if you're going to do something very stressful, like for example, I'll be doing the night skate, a 13 mile skate in San Francisco on Friday night. I better plan to recover on Saturday morning. If I'm smart, I'm gonna schedule in a certain color on my Google calendar, my Calendly, Donovan recovery time Saturday morning. Um, so, so here's another thing you can tangibly do on your calendar. If you're gonna have a big party weekend, if you're gonna run a marathon, if you're gonna do a big workout at Orange Theory or whatever, the next day, maybe you don't. Maybe you call that your recovery day, okay? We need, or if you're gonna visit a friend at the hospital, if it's gonna be physiologically, emotionally, or phys, uh, psychologically taxing, take a day off the next day. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about sleep other than that is probably the best rest for your brain and thus your mind and your body. So uh, lots of great stuff. Um, Ariana Huffington published a book called The Sleep Revolution when she was on campus with uh, Golden, the former Golden State Warrior. Um, 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 oh my God, and then it just dropped out of my brain. Uh, uh, um, I'll, I'll think of it, but she brought one of the Golden State Warriors to talk about the value of sleep in his career. Um, and, and she also had uh, some, some challenges related to exhaustion that led to her writing the book. So that's just one sleep. There's many sleep um, resources out there. So if there aren't any other questions, I wanna dive into differentiating types of rest. And this is just Donovan's take on it. Again, the article I sent out um, has a lot. Okay, so Roxanne has a question. Yeah. Um, I had just, a, there was just a couple comments in the chat, uh, but the one of them was bringing up the name of the person you were initially talking about, Andre Iguodala. Oh Andre. yeah, yeah, Andre Iguodala. Thank you, thank <laughs> you. So Andre Iguodala was in college at ASU at Arizona State, I believe, or Arizona, well, sorry if I get it wrong, because I know that's not a good thing to do, but it's one of the Arizona schools. And he would sleep for four hours in the afternoon, and then he would wonder why he wasn't sleeping at night, and his sleep hygiene was horrible. And so then he got a, now he has a sleep trained, Stanford trained sleep coach, in addition to a yoga coach and a stretching coach. And even if he's retired, he probably has all these coaches. So Iguodala was here in his really cool socks. I remember he was wearing these cool socks. And he's so cool, and I like him a lot. He has a sleep coach to help him be a world champion uh, Golden State Warrior. So, if, so, so maybe you can't afford you maybe you can't afford a sleep coach, but maybe you can afford to buy uh, Ariana Huffington's book or or take a class from Hip on sleep. But we need to be, get better at sleep because if, unless if your sleep is messed up, people. By the way, you know not to be flip with this. But there's a reason why when people torture other people, they, the first tool in their torture tool belt is sleep deprivation. That is like, there's a reason for that because it works. And so please, please, please. There's so much great sleep tech out there. We've got the sleep center. My daughter had a sleep study done at Stanford. By the way, there's so much good stuff around sleep apnea now. I'm reading a book called Breathe. My brother sent me this and this was actually referred by a Stanford person. I read it out too. There. Oh, did you read Breathe? Yeah, yes. by James Nestor, right? Yes. Incredible. Can you put it in the chat? Absolutely. Put it, oh my God. The first, the first chapter, the first half chapter will change the way you think about breathing. Breathing is not just a way to get water, uh, water oxygen. That's, uh, am I a fish? What's up with that? Um, to get oxygen into your system. It is so much more than that. Read Nestor. He's a great writer. Read Nestor's book on breathing. Um, but, but sleep apnea and the, the sleep is a big part of why we're not sleeping because we've devolved to have very small cavities that, that close at night. And then we, we basically choke every time we're trying to sleep. So please get that diagnosis, get that pap, that sleep pap machine or whatever. Great. Deep breath. Okay. So yes. Vegging out is important. Please give yourself a little bit of that. You know, Netflix has really changed our life uh, because now you can binge watch. That's a problem. But yes, we need to venge out a little bit. We need to relax. We'll talk about video games in a second because that's a different thing. But 
yes, there is absence of work types of rest where you're just, just sitting there doing nothing. You're not, it's not inspiring. That's enrich, it's not enriching. It's low output, but it's also low input. So yes, do some of that. But if you do too much of low output and low input, you're going to get tired um, because by the way, people don't think about this, but we, we, vil we villainize, we vilify stress. But here's, here's the deal, people. If I scare you right now, if I say boo, and I scare you right now, I've actually, that's called, a, for sleep, for, sorry, for stress researchers, that's called arousal. So your partner scares you or your partner arouses you in other ways, sexual and romantic, or you're just visiting, you know, your, you know, your mom and your mom stresses you out and that's arousal. Or you hear the term taxes before tax day and that's arousing to you. Believe it or not, stress is catalyzing of energy. Anger is energizing, okay? I'm not saying it's all good. I'm saying that these are sources of energy. The problem with passive rest is it's not energizing at all. We're just sitting there watching our show and it's been you know, three hours and now we're exhausted. Or that's why sleeping too much can make you more tired because you don't have enough energizing energy to catalyze motion, emotion, or um, a, little bit of, a little bit of cortisol, a little bit of adrenaline to get us going, okay? Norepinephrine or, or the uh, opiates that we get when we run, uh, right? Uh, what do we call those? Uh, not dopamine, but um, um, what, are the, not, what do we call it? When you go for a run and you're high on endorphins, that I, you know, people get like people like to run. Okay, they get those endorphin eye. So, so, so here's the point. I'll leave this, but just the right amount of passive rest because it doesn't give you anything back. That's what the rest of this talk is going to be about. How can we find rest, deep rest, deep play, inspirational rest, inspirational activities, uh, concerts, even YouTube videos that inspire us. But how can we get things that we call rest that are not work that give us something back as well as not take out the thing that we're resting from like work? Does that follow? Uh, video games can be a problem. They are restful in some ways, but they also, I think, produce a lot of adrenaline and dopamine. And so the reason why you're exhausted is not only because you were playing multiplayer, you know, mass, whatever, video games until 3 a.m., that'll, that'll do it itself. But because now you're dopamine depleted and your adrenaline, you're just, you're totally fried from what adrenaline does to your body. And by the way, adrenaline and, and norepinephrine lead to, you know, chronic illness related to, uh, what do we call it? Um, you know, stress-related illness. Okay, so, so, so yes, video games, okay. They aren't, they aren't restful. Okay. I have a theory, by the way, also that because they mimic uh, reward seeking behaviors, I, I have a theory that after I play a bunch of video games, I'm actually less driven to, to seek rewards like, you know, like to do stuff like cleaning up the garage, like um, just, just reward seeking behaviors, grocery shopping. Like, like I think, I think video games have a downside because we don't want to do other reward seeking behaviors. Now, that's my opinion. Okay. And, and, and I, I'm, I, I bet you there's neuroscience and, and neurological, physiological science that act that. Questions, comments so far. I, I'm a really good teacher. I'll admit that. But there have to be something I'm missing, something that people have comments about. Yeah. Roxanne. There's, there's just, there's a couple comments. Um, I'll read one from when we were talking about books earlier. There's an audio audible book called The Pursuit of Healthiness by Blake Griffin episode where he interviews Ariana Huffington, where she discusses the importance of rest. So that's just a fun Thank comment. Um, another person just has a question. Do people crave the fried feeling, quote unquote, fried to force into rest? Being fried? Yes. Like tired, exhausted. I'm assuming is what they're saying. You know, I guess that's a good question. That would be a more of a psychological question. What's our relationship with that? I know that, by the way, you know, knowing your psychological profile around being tired is really a good thing. What happens in your body and what happens to your thoughts and your psychology? I'll give you an example. I, I have a daughter that 
she, when she's really tired, she cries. And so it manifests as sadness when she's tired. I actually go into fear when I'm tired. I go into like scarcity of, of resources and fear when I'm tired. Um, so, so asking yourself just what are the clues to that you're exhausted? Uh, some people, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe don't, they, they go into a shell and don't talk to other people. Other people crave connection. I don't know. Um, some people eat a lot. Sometimes I, I mistake my, my fatigue for being hungry. So my tired feeling, I think it's, oh, I need more calories. And, and what I need is a nap. So knowing your, your biological profile, your psychological profile for fatigue is very important because those are the clues to what to do next. To answer this person's question, um, I do know that, that it is kind of nice when I'm, when I'm going to bed and I feel so exhausted. There's a, there's a deliciousness, just like when you're really hungry and you're about to have a good meal, there's a, very, there's a deliciousness to being very hungry and then eating your favorite Ike sandwich. Or, or Bernardo when he's having his wraps at, at Koopa, right? There's something delicious about being hungry. That So I don't know if that's what you're talking about to the question asker. Maybe, maybe when we're really tired, we feel like we just, we, just, we, just, we just rode 35 miles with our buddies in the hills and now we're at Alice's restaurant and we're gonna have this beautiful meal together and there's a delicious feeling to being empty and then we're gonna fill up. I don't, I don't know if that's what they're asking, but my sense is that could be there. I also think that it could turn, it could trigger people into a state of, like I said, sadness, anger, um, just really resentful. By the way, let me just say this: uh, give me a thumbs up if you if your cue to that you're overgiving, and, and that's a little bit of different language than I've used so far in this talk. Give me a thumbs up or some other sign that you feel resentful. Clue to you that you've been an overgiver. There's overgivers out there. Give me a thumbs up if that that resonates with you. Solomon, can that you repeat that, that line? You start feeling resentful of your kids. Can you repeat that line? Just, just that 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 you start to. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you repeat that line of what we should be giving a thumbs up on? I the internet cut out for me. I'm not sure if it cut out for everybody else. If, if you start to notice that resentment arises in you, e even when you're doing stuff you love, even when you love Stanford students, even though you love your family, even though you love your partner, but you're an overgiver and you have given too much and your body says, no, we got to stop this. And, and it, it manifests as resentment that res you start resenting people does anybody does that resonate with people give me a thumbs up if that resonates with you i see some of my filipino colleagues smiling and and i say that because my mom is an overgiver by the way give me a thumbs up if you had a mom that was an overgiver <laughs> if you have a mom that's an overgiver and you modeled yourself as i did over that this is this is really important data people for your biological profile for your cultural profile for your for your ancestral profile because one of the reasons why you might not be able to let yourself rest is because you're trying to model your life, a lot of M's here, you're modeling your life as over um, after your martyr mother. Your model is your martyr mother. And if that's true for you, you're going to have trouble resting and rationalizing rest until, oh, some more R's here. So if you have a martyr mother and you're modeling your life over them, then you're going to have a hard time rationalizing rest until you feel deeply resentful. I didn't plan on, by the way, this is a little Donovan side note. This is juicy, people. This is juicy. Please write that down if that resonates for you. Because that's going to be your, your stumbling block. Your stumbling block to all the R words that are on the screen right now is going to be that my mom would, would, would be bleeding, you know, you know, sweating blood, giving to us, baking cookies. And I have to be like her. Uh, that's, not, that's not how we want to do this. Because I've sat with my mom crying because, because how my, my, you know, my parents helped my, my, my relatives to immigrate to the United States. They, they, went, they, they wrote, you know, the visas and the this and that and went to the courthouse to help my ancestor to get here. And then she's crying because now they, they're not grateful. They're not grateful for all the things we did for them, right? 
that's resentment arising because they didn't, my mom didn't have a sense of how to uh, have a good balance of giving. Giving is beautiful. Oh, by the way, another book, by the way, Kepler's, you know what? Hey, Reckon Wellness, can we get Kepler's to sponsor this? Because we're selling a ton of books right now. Can we get YouTube to sponsor this? Because we're, we're, we're dropping a lot of names right now. So this is a business model happening here. Um, um, Adam Grant from Wharton. Adam Grant from Wharton, big shot, okay? He has a book called Give and Take. If you're an overgiver, we want you to still be a giver, but he starts to question what it means to be selfish. And he comes up with another term of his own called otherish. He talks about the, the, the most successful people around and how they're, they actually are very generous with their time, but they also have good boundaries. So now we get into Brene Brown territory, right? The people who have the best boundaries are the most generous. Okay, that's Brene Brown, selling more books. So, but Adam Grant, give and take. If you're an overgiver, read this book. It will help you to titrate your giving so that you can include yourself in your circle of giving so you can have a sustainable, back to climate change, back to our planet, how can you become a sustainable giver? Like KQED, right? How can you become a sustaining member of yourself so that you cannot burn out on giving and then be pissed off at KQED and all your friends because they keep asking you for cookies, okay? So, so active rest includes recharge, refuel. I still haven't edited the slide, but it's okay. Rejuvenation is so important. It's on the list twice. Uh, recharge, recover, refill, refuel, rejuvenate, renew, replenish, resource, restore, re rejuvenate again. Uh, rec recreate, reinvigorate, re-energize. So I love these R words. Put them on your walls, on your mirror. You deserve all of these things. You are worthy. By the way, notice how you feel when Donovan says this. You are worthy. You are deeply worthy of all of these R words. I want you to chat in right now. Let's share some resonance and some vulnerability. I want you to chat in right now. What comes up with you when Donovan says, you are worthy of these R words? What comes up for you? Is it like, you're damn right I am. And that's why I have coffee with my good friend and walk the dish every weekend or I go to my yoga class or my soul cycle or my orange theory, religiously, my Peloton is my best friend. I was caught hugging my Peloton the other day. You, not, not me, I don't, I, I bike out in the world, but you, so, so chat into the chat. I can't see it, so I'm gonna try if I can find it and, and maybe Roxanne can help me to, to hear some of the comments. But what comes up for you? Because again, we want this to land in your heart and soul. And in order to do that, we have to find the obstacles, we need to find the obstacles before we can get it to land. And if you don't feel worthy, then we're gonna have problems here. All right, let's look at some of this real quick. And, and let's hopefully we have time to, okay, we're good, we're good on time. I talk really fast. Okay, so some stuff on resentment. Um, somebody said, yes, the resentment for me comes from violating my own boundaries and then I project it on the others. Isn't that a beautiful comment? I won't say your name in case you want to be, uh, you know, discreet. But this person, so isn't that beautiful? Must have must must be a therapist. This person used the word project. They said, "I'm re I'm resentful of others, but it's not actually about my friend Jenny who asked me to pick up some groceries for her because she broke her leg. It's not about Jenny. It's about Donovan not taking care of Donovan, and I'm blaming Jenny, who has a broken leg. Donovan, come on now." And so you project onto others. If you're resentful of others, it means you're not taking care of you. That's about you, not about them. They may be over askers, but if you had better boundaries, you wouldn't. Oh, here's another one, people. How many people of you get mad at other people for asking you for something? when it, indeed it's your job to serve this. So Donovan gets mad at Stanford students for asking them for help when indeed that's my job, by the way. 
that's a good example here because we are projecting on them. We're saying you're an over asker. No, 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 no. Here's what it means. It means two things. If I think somebody is an over asker, chances are Donovan is an overgiver and not managing that. And two, Donovan does not trust Donovan to set a good boundary with that person. I don't trust Donovan to set a boundary. And thus I say, well, what's, how dare you ask me for an orange? I give oranges to everybody. And you're going to ask me for an orange? No, that, that is me not trusting Donovan. So here's the antidote. And I got this, shout out to Carol Protosky, my good friend and former supervisor. She taught me, I, I don't know if she made this up or not, but she taught me the no sandwich, which is a way to set a boundary with, with people. If somebody says, hey, Donovan, can you help me clean out my garage this weekend? And you're not so down on cleaning out the garage, you say the no sandwich is positive, negative, positive, positive, no, positive. Okay. Jenny, thank you so much for thinking about me for your little pizza party to clean out your garage. Um, I'd love to, um, like uh, next month. By the way, don't promise if you can't follow through. Uh, next year, uh, 2022 asked me again, but right now I'm busy with this thing I'm doing. And so, no, I can't help you this summer at all. Okay. But um, if I, if you want to go for a walk at the dish and get a cup, a cup of cafe Coupa, it's great coffee. Love to do it. Love to walk in the dish. I want to infer, affirm our relationship. Yes. To walk in the dish and getting coffee. No period to clean out your garage. So that's a very, more specifically, it's the no sandwich. I don't know who invented that. So whoever invented that, shout out to you. But when you start to trust yourself to say no to other people, you will be less resentful that they ask because you'll be like, go ahead and ask, go ahead and ask. But I'm going to say, I'm going to say, right. Okay, good stuff. Uh, somebody said, uh, I'm upset with myself for overextending. Mom was an overgiver. So yes, so moms, 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 we love them. We love moms. That's why they're great moms. But we also took advantage of them, didn't we? We took advantage of those moms and to get our needs met. And now they're kind of resentful. And now we're getting paid back if we're a parent now too. Okay, so Adam Grant, he has a podcast, uh, Gratefulness, okay. Okay, intrigued by the concept of physical activity as rest. But, so let me just, because we, we were running out of time, I want to make sure this lands people. My opinion is that rest is doing something other than what you're tired of doing. Rest is doing something else other than what you're tired of doing. So I'll give you an example. So a few weeks ago, one of my colleagues was leaving the country to move back home to be closer to family. And I have a, a minivan and I'm good at distributing stuff. So I said to her, I'll come over and take all your Goodwill stuff and all your recycle stuff and, and I'll, I'll help you get rid of it. I, 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 it ended up being very stressful, but I am good at that. So um, this was a, a, during a Wednesday during the work week and I took time off and it ended up being very restful for two reasons. One, I spent a lot of my day on Zoom talking to people about psychological concepts and wrestling with intangible stuff. I, on this Wednesday, put on my coveralls, put on my gloves, got my hands dirty, moved tangible objects, and got to be social with a good, close, personal friend during COVID. So people are like, Donovan, you took a day off to help a friend move. And I said to them, that was extremely restful. Why? Because it is the opposite, if such thing exists, from what I do on a regular Monday or Tuesday in my job. So to me, yeah, hiking the Grand Canyon is exhausting if you've ever done it. But people call it deep rest because it's different than being on Zoom on a business call. So rest is the, is what is the antidote? What is the medicine? What is the nourishment? There it is. What is the nutrient? What is the nourishment that you need to get to counteract whatever you gave away doing work? So if you don't want to call it rest, call it resourcing. 
If you don't want to call it rest, call it rejuvenation or filling your bucket. Okay. So yes, physically exhausted. If you ever stayed up late uh, bonding with a good friend you haven't seen in a while, you're physically exhausted, but emotionally enriched and full. Do you see the difference? It's where are your buckets full and where are your buckets empty? And you may be doing the same thing. At, you, know, you may be doing the opposite at the same time. You're physically exhausted because it's three in the morning, but you're emotionally enriched because you're, you're just sat with a good friend for three hours or six hours or whatever. Does that speak to your question there? Okay. Uh, the person who, who chimed in about walking or, or physical activity as rest. I feel validated that I am loved by you telling me, beautiful, look, you know, when we allow our children to rest by tucking them in at night, that is, that is an act of love, okay? When we visit a friend at the hospital to soothe their wounds, we're, that's an act of love. So when we give ourselves the ability to rest, what a loving thing. You know, maybe, maybe at bedtime tonight, even if you haven't done the dishes, even if you haven't finished all the work, by the way, uh, be careful what you ask for. Done is dead is one of my quotes. This is a, like from a Buddhist meditation. Done is dead. The day when the emails are done, the laundry is done, the dishes are done, and you no longer have anything else to do. That's either retirement, although you still have laundry, or you're dead. So, so please don't ask for that, uh, I don't think. But when you go to sleep at night, maybe you can, you, can, you can just have a mantra that I am worthy of going to sleep tonight, no matter how much got done or not. I am, and, and don't over-identify with productivity. So, so as, as the saying goes, do you identify mostly as a human doing or are you a human being? And maybe our planet would be a lot healthier if we were less a human consumer and a human doer and more of a human being. Volunteering is a great way to take a break and gain perspective. Beautiful. So, so volunteer work could be very restful for some people. Okay, so I want to make sure I get through some of the slides here. Again, if you want this more in depth with more discussion and more high touch, more interaction, join the HIP class I'm doing on two Fridays in July. I believe it's two Fridays in July, July 2nd and 9th, I believe. Yeah, so overwhelm people. Um, the best metaphor for overwhelm is drinking water through a fire hose. I do not suggest thinking, drinking anything uh, in, in a tube over the size of a boba straw. Boba straw is probably the biggest straw you should ever use to ingest liquid um, and boba tea. Um, so overwhelm is something to watch out for people as a form of stress. Um, I heard from Tal Ben-Shahar that overwhelm is linked to depression, by the way. So please look out for situational and state-based and trait-based manifestations of overwhelm because it, it can lead to depression and it's not a good way to ingest life. So, and by the way, if you're a, by the way, if you identify as sensitive also, then you have, you will get overwhelmed faster than the average person. So there's a lot more research and, and application around people who identify as a sensitive child or a sensitive person. So all of us are ingesting life uh, through a fire hose called the internet. So please find ways to titrate your ingestion of the internet and everything else and just deal with overwhelm. Um, but, but let's talk, the person who, who chimed in about needing to do everything, because that's a complicated question. Our ancestors had to survive plagues just as we do and wars. And yet, uh, sadly, we've never been more busy than we ever have been. We have microwave ovens, we have the internet, we have refrigerators, and we've never been more busy. So this question of what we need to do, um, let's talk, because I'm not sure that what we need to do is what we have to do, really. So, okay, so let's wrap up here. So active rest includes time for contemplation and reflection. Um, 
uh, active rest includes the things that put inspiration back into your aspirations. And I'll go into this later, but uh, both of these words um, have the, the Latin root sperar, which, 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 which is based on the breath. So how do you put inspiration back into your aspirations? Um, this, by the way, is a whole other talk. Maybe Rec and Wellness will bring me back to do my talk on emotional regulation systems. This talk has been about the soothing system the time and space you take to feel content, safe, protected, cared for, and trusted. So, so let's grow our soothing system. Rick Hansen would say that we need time to pet the lizard, feed the mouse, and hug the monkey. What do you do every day to, to calm down the fear systems, to feed the hunger systems, and to hug the mammalian systems? We need to do all these things to, to calm the neuroses, our cultural and individual neuroses that we have there. And I'll end where we started again. Did it really, did you really make it to your PhD or to your high level job if you arrived there in pieces? According to Black Ashley from Twitter, your wholeness matters. Your wholeness matters. Does it matter that you got your PhD if you arrived depressed and anxious and not knowing yourself and hating yourself and suicidal? Does it matter? And this is a call to Stanford. I, Stanford, I call you to justice. Does it matter if our students achieve if they arrive in pieces? And I know you pay my very reasonable salary, but I, Stanford needs and Harvard and and Dartmouth, who just had another suicide, we need to answer this question. And Justin Bieber would say it this way, what if you had it all but nobody to call? And I see Donovan's version, I am what I do and I fail. Maybe it's time to stop being. Well, I think we have to wrap up. Uh, um, uh, Roxanne is, is, is getting, you know, wants to wrap no, it up. No, it's okay. Roxanne, by the <laughs> way, can we save the chat? That would be awesome. Yeah. And hey, if you want, I can make you host. And if you want to stay on and answer some questions, feel free. I'll go ahead.